Well, Jim, thank you very much. And, and I'm going to be very informal today. I'm going to speak for a few minutes and, uh, and leave most of the time for discussion. Um, Jim, it's, uh, it's good to be back with you. Gosh, this is a long table. <laughs> Jim and I uh, go back at least 25 years. Jim was the city manager in Aurora years ago when I was chairman of the Aurora Planning and Zoning Commission. And we spent many a, a Wednesday evening together, uh, hopefully planning Aurora and, uh, and doing good things for the, for the people of uh, Aurora. It's great to be here and thanks for, for, um, for your interest as civic leaders and as persons who care about Colorado in, in not only this issue, but in so many other things you do for Colorado. One of the challenges we face as a democracy is, is we don't get enough involvement. We don't get enough people who care enough to give a few mornings a week to come out and talk about important issues. And, and this is certainly one of many important issues we're facing as a state and, and obviously as a, as a country. You know, over the years I've been involved in a lot of controversial subjects and I learned a long time ago that, that uh, you'd better learn to get along with people you disagree with because in my case, I ended up disagreeing with sometimes a lot of people. I, uh, I was literally the only Republican at the LBJ School of Public Affairs in the student body during uh, Watergate. Um, it was a small school then. We had 50 students in our student body. Um, we probably had 25 Marxist-Leninists, a number of, <laughs> number of Maoists. We had uh, you know, 10 or 15 liberal Democrats, and then there was myself. And it was pretty challenging because every day I'd come in, you know, walking into the graduate school, and some of you have seen it. It's right next to that beautiful library on the Texas campus. And they'd say, Owens, what about, uh, what about Watergate today? And, and uh, so Nixon says he's not a crook, and uh, Agnew resigns. And <laughs> <clears throat> I was pretty much the only person that uh, they had ever met that, it was, that was a Republican. And uh, <laughs> So what I learned from that as well as from working for Congressman Jim Wright, Jim was the Speaker of the House, a uh, close friend of mine. I was appointed by him to be his page and spent a year with him in, in Washington, D.C. And what I learned was that, that one of the, the, the best things we can do is learn to, to disagree and remain friends. And obviously on, there's a lot of issues that we have a lot of opinions on, but as I tell my class at DU, if you took a look at the continuum of policy disagreements over history, and I'm thinking going back thousands of years in terms of what people used to believe and what people used to kill one another over, the entire American political debate is probably in 1% of the most moderate range of that continuum. You know, in terms of we all agree, one person, one vote, we believe in equal rights. We believe that government shouldn't be able to imprison without cause and eventually without trial. We believe in, in the rule of law. We believe in private property. We have such a large area of agreement that I think it's important to remember that on those areas we disagree because in the entire range of human history, they're relatively modest disagreements um, even in this room, probably even on immigration, if you really ran the continuum on, on the range of possibilities. I do teach here with Dick Lamb. We just finished a two-day seminar about three weeks ago. Dick and I debated six different topics over two days. He's a close friend. Our debates are always uh, professional and, and actually we do agree in some areas, but we, we, we debated on health care. We debated on peak oil, and I know that we have some oil professionals here, and the concept of peak oil is we're running out. We debated on a world of limits. Dick would believe, and I don't think he'd disagree with my characterization, that we're facing limits in the world, and I'm a little bit more macro. I believe that, that, that in fact, uh, I'm, I'm more of an optimist than Dick is. Global warming, I'm not quite as pessimistic as Dick is. I think a challenge we may be facing sometime in the near future is actually a cooling, a gradual cooling as the earth goes through cycles, but I won't go into that today. We also debated a little bit on immigration because on immigration, I'm slightly more moderate than Dick Lamb is. And that's why, that's why uh, 
this will be an interesting morning, I, I, I hope. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> you know, in, in, in speaking of my moderation on, on immigration, I'm thinking that if I were a father in Mexico and my children were hungry <clears throat> and I did, didn't have a job, and the challenge was feeding my children, would I cross a border to go to work? And I would. If the situation was reversed, I would do exactly what so many good people from Mexico and Central and South America and from around the world do. I would, in fact, cross that geographic border in order to work. And that's what so many, if the vast majority of the men and women who come here from second and third world countries are here to do. They're here to, to work. They're doing what they have to do to support their, their family. Um, I'm extremely empathetic. I know many of them. I was working late last night in my office in the tech center. Partners in a land and water company. I'm on five listed boards. Um, Full-time business person, like so many of us and you, was working late last night and the gentleman coming in to clean the office around 8 or 8.30, I'm sure he was here um, illegally, didn't speak any English. Um, I'm not characterizing, I'm not, but my guess is, is that this gentleman was here and he's, he's really the topic of today. Working hard, just wants to stay below the radar, is just trying to earn 20 or $30 a day, sending 60 or 70% of it back to his family and to his, his, his in family in his country. All he wants to do is earn a living. He doesn't want to be a political issue. He doesn't want to cause anybody any trouble. He's just here to earn a living. And I've seen these men and women out in front of the Home Depot and standing on the corners hoping for day labor. And I just think, what a tough life. You know, they've come across that border. The coyotes have, have extorted from them. They've put their, their lives at risk. They sometimes arrive in a town like this knowing hardly anybody, and then they're out really at the, at the mercy of this system, trying to get a job, and if they should run into the law, though this doesn't happen very often, they might get deported back, being forced to leave their family. So I'm extremely empathetic about them. I know a number of undocumented or illegal immigrants, and uh, my heart goes out to them. However, it doesn't mean that I'm in favor of open borders. It doesn't mean that I'm in favor of, of amnesty in effect giving them a head start based on those who are waiting in line. And it doesn't mean that, that, that those of us in the United States should wink at the rule of law, because the rule of law is what differentiates us from so many other societies and cultures around the world historically. I have a couple of thoughts on immigration. These aren't unique, and they're maybe not even connected. First, obviously, the United States is built on immigration. And that's what really has made us such a spectacular success. If you ask me if I believe in American ac exceptionalism, I do. I believe that the United States of America is, is an exceptional country. And I think one of the reasons why we're exceptional is, is because we're literally built on the best and the brightest. The men and women who have come to the United States and who were most of our ancestors were the men and women who really had the courage the vision, the drive, and the willingness to risk everything to better themselves. Um, the Mormon Church gave me, when I was governor, my, my most valuable gift I've ever received, other than some family gifts. And they gave me a four-volume genealogy of my family. They came to me in my first year or two as governor, and they said, may we give you this in a few years, and if so, would you cooperate with us and our genealogists in terms of building your family tree? And I said, sure. So I introduced them to my mother and pulled together a few of the rudimentary records we had and gave them to my friends in the Mormon church and actually kind of forgot about it until three or four years later, they, I get a call and they say, we've got your genealogy. May we present it to you? And I said, I'd love to. Uh, tell me about it. And they said, well, we had 30 people working on it. And uh, um, I said, well, would they like to come down to the Capitol? I was thinking local. It turns out they were from North Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, um, all of the states that my ancestors had come through. 
And um, a couple of weeks later, we have this large meeting in this, in this conference room, and they present me not a family tree. I thought it was going to be one page. Four volumes, probably 700 pages, going back to the 1700s. <clears throat> and it's immigration records, it's, it's obituaries, it's, it's, they've gone and clipped newspapers, and, and it's, it's the most amazing gift you could ever be given. I now know exactly where I'm from. And I'm three-fourths Irish. Two of the three persons were on the same coffin boat. They left in 1851 on the same boat. We don't know if they met before and got on the boat together, this, 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 this woman and man, or if they met on the boat or if they met after they got here. But two of them were on the same coffin boat, <coughs> which sank the next year off the coast of Ireland. One of them came in illegally through Canada. That's the third Irish component. And the fourth is German and came in through Eureka, California. I don't know how they got around there, but that's where they arrived. And, and I really believe that these are the best and brightest of their generation. I mean, what courage does it take to get out on a boat with 10 or 20 or 50 or $100 and no job and no social system and just go to the new world? And that's continuing. That's really what I believe the strength of the United States is. We really are the children of that sort of ancestor. I spend a lot of time in Russia, and I, I'm on the board of a large Russian company. I represent the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development on, on Russia's second largest railroad. And uh, I've been going there as a tour guide from the 80s, and I'm, if I have an area of expertise, it's Russia. And compare our history to theirs. I think Russia is essentially a failing culture. I think that, that their best and brightest have usually gotten killed. And I'm going to write a, a, a piece on this one of these days. You look at what they've gone through and the people in their society who raised their hand and said, I'll volunteer, or I want to be a priest, or I want to be a general, or I want to be a, a middle class farmer, or I'm the brave guy in, in, in the First World War, or the brave person in the Second World War who obeys orders and charges the lines, they're all dead. And I think that Russian, Russia today is paying the price for this decimation of their successful classes over the last five or six generations. We're quite the reverse. So I believe in immigration, and, and I want it to continue. But there's a huge difference between the legal immigration of the past, which was self-selected, and, and I'm reminded of, in, in terms of making this point, of one of my favorite sayings, and it, it goes to the old Oregon Trail, the settlers on it. There was a, somebody wrote on one of the rocks along the Oregon Trail, the cowards never started, and the weak died on the road. Well, that's part of the reason why the United States is so successful. We are, in fact, the children of those who were strong and brave. Today, to some degree, it's a little bit different. Um, instead of taking that sort of, of person who was ready to leave the old world, cross an ocean, set aside the past, and, and adopt completely I would argue, American culture, American values. Today we have a little bit different challenge. Very good people walking across the border under some significant challenge, but often not ready to assimilate. And I'm a strong believer in assimilation. I think any American citizen ought to understand what it is like, and obviously many of, many of those of us who were born here don't understand this, but I really do believe that America is an exceptional country, and I'm concerned that the numbers of persons who've been coming illegally to the United States <clears throat> for the best of their reasons and for entirely humane reasons on their own are more than we can absorb and keep this special country. Not a nativist, very strongly pro-immigration, but I'm pro-legal immigration. And so, first point is, is that immigration's been good for the United States. Second point, and it's going to be a pro-immigration argument, is, is that as a world, we're about to reach zero population growth. And I had this discussion with, with Governor Lamb a couple of weeks ago. The United Nations es believes, estimates, that by 2050, 2060, we will have peaked in terms of population in the world. Most countries are peaking or have peaked right now. Um, old Europe, um, there isn't a country there that in 10 years is expected to have more people than it has today. 
Um, you look at Russia, the demography of Russia is, average uh, life expectancy of a male born in, in Russia today is 53. Ours is 78. Theirs has declined in the last five years, it has declined five years in the last 20. Um, demography is destiny. And the United States and Canada are very lucky. And I was just in Vancouver over the weekend at a business conference where a, a futurist gave this lecture. The US and Canada are very lucky because our population is going to continue to moderately expand, partly because of immigration, which is a good thing. A growing economy and a growing population over the next 50 and 100 years gives the United States and Canada, incidentally, a huge advantage, and Mexico as well. The good news for us is Mexican population is rapidly slowing down its dramatic rate of growth increase. One of the reasons why we have so many Mexican and South, Central and South American immigrants here is their fertility rate per, per um, childbearing aged woman has been three and four versus our 2.1, but theirs is dropping rapidly, and that's going to start to slow this issue in a few years, five to ten years, as Mexican economic growth can start to catch up with their, their birth rate. But, but having a larger population, I would suggest, and I made Dick and I spend a couple hours discussing this here at DU a couple of weeks ago, is a very good thing for the United States. And incidentally, even at essentially full build out of the U.S. population, as, it, as it's expected to be in 50 or 60 years, our density rate compared to Europe is about one-tenth. And so um, in Colorado, for example, as many people as we have here, if you take Interstate 25 through the state north to south, and if you take I-70 east to west and go 20 miles on e each side of, of those two highways, that's where 90% of Coloradans live. It's in about 5% of the, the land mass of, of Colorado not suggesting we need a lot more people here, but we're not overpopulated. France is about the size of Colorado, has a population of 60 or 70 million, and we're at uh, four and a half million. So, so, so I'm, I'm an optimist regarding the future of the United States, and part of it is, is because we're going to continue to have um, a larger population. Never been a society, and I just saw this in the journal a couple of weeks ago, which has had a declining population, which has been able to have increasing economic growth on a per capita basis. It's a real challenge. So, so what's happening to the world is about to help us a lot. And, and um, a gentleman named George Friedman has written an excellent book, The Next 100 Years. And, uh, and if I could afford to, I'd send you all a copy. But uh, if you, we all have way too many books to read. But his book um, really makes this point well. So I'm, I'm in favor of legal immigration. And I'm also in favor, and I don't like to use the term very often, but I'm in favor of putting quotas, not based on race or ethnicity, but I want to see additional points given for us to encourage educated people to come here. I want to follow the Canadian model. I want to see. Uh, education and professions rewarded. Um, I believe that it makes sense to encourage college graduates, engineers, scientists, physicians. I would encourage uh, military professionals, pilots, those areas which the United States may be lacking, engineers again, uh, physicists. I would encourage them to immigrate here. That's what Canada does. It's not necessarily in our best interest to encourage 16-year-old uneducated men who haven't finished high school. That, that typically costs us as a society, and I'll leave plenty of time to have a discussion later in terms of the data that I, I believe would make that point. What should we do? Well, in no particular order, I think we need to encourage um, economic development in Mexico and Central and South America because, because a, a, a lot of of our challenge would go away if these good men and women had jobs in their own countries. Strong supporter of NAFTA, was pleased to see that President Obama is not going to reopen negotiations on NAFTA. It's been a huge benefit to Colorado, to the United States, to Mexico, and to Canada. And uh, we need to encourage, in fact, free trade. 
Um, we need to sign with Panama. We certainly need to sign with Colombia. What a valiant country that is still being punished, um, I think, for American political reasons because of the power of American labor. Um, a lot of brave people in Colombia have righted that country, and President Uribe deserves our support. But also, it's in our best interest because a rising tide does lift all boats. And so we need to, first of all, do everything we can to encourage economic development south of us. Um, Wayne Murdy heard me speak at uh, Colorado School of Mines a couple of months ago, so I, I hate to have him here this a second time. But the Wall Street Journal Index of, of, of uh, Economic Freedom, it's published every year in the journal, and it measures 150 countries by their economic freedom based on an index. U.S. is eighth or ninth in the world, Singapore is first or second, Switzerland's second or third, but it basically takes all these countries, measures them, and then it takes a look at the out outcome. And it turns out that there is a direct positive correlation between economic freedom and, and income. The more free you are, the wealthier the society. And a second point that Wayne heard me make is, is that democracies have never warred on one another. Think about that for a moment, and I'm going to tie the two together in a second. There's never been an instance of two democracies waging war on one another. Not one. Argentina wasn't in 1982 with the Brits. Um, Germany wasn't in 39 by the time it went to war with, uh, with the Allies. So uh, we got to do two things. One, we got to encourage democracy. If you want peace, encourage democracy. It works. And if you want to end poverty, encourage markets, because that works as well. And I'd like to see us continue to do that south of the border. Second, I think we need to close the border. You can't have a legal system of immigration if you have a much easier illegal system. Even if that legal system is fast and fair and only costs $100 and only takes three months, it isn't going to work if you can walk across the border. So if you believe in legal immigration, you've got to, to close that border. I've been in Israel. I've been right up against the fence. It works. I know Mexico is a friendly country. I'm really close to a number of its presidents. Um, I love what they've done in terms of democracy, but until they can control their side, we have a responsibility as a, as a sovereign nation to make sure that people don't come here who we don't agree to have come here. Few other countries in the world are as open as we are in allowing you to walk across a border. So if you want to reform the system, you do have to close the border. And I guess I would, I would uh, agree with President Obama on this. Last July, he said, I'm going to make immigration a top priority my first year as president. Not only because we have an obligation to secure our borders, get control of what comes in and out of our country. He's right. And not only because we have to crack down on employers who are abusing undocumented immigrants instead of hiring citizens. He's right. But because we have to finally bring undocumented immigrants out of the shadows. Yes, they broke the law. They should have to pay a fine, learn English, go back to the back of the line. I agree with everything President Obama said. I think we need to close the border. I don't know how to do it, but it is possible. And, and, and uh, that's a a precondition almost to reforming this system. Third, I, I think we need to increase targeted legal immigrants. I mentioned this earlier. I'd like to see us have a system where we say we want more immigration, but we also want to have a say in terms of, of the backgrounds and the type of persons we allow into our country. And I think basically we ought to be somewhat cold-hearted about it. It ought to be on a net present value basis. Does it help us or not? We can't afford, and Dick Lamb makes this point very well, as a liberal welfare society, and I don't say that pejoratively, I say it descriptively, we can't afford to just let anybody in here who wants to come because you simply can't afford to fund our system for everybody in the world, and, and, and that would be what you would become. And so I would, I would suggest that we should increase substantially legal immigration and we should target it. 
I think we need to have an, a guest worker program, a humane program. We, uh, when we have a jobs here that are not going filled, when we have willing and able workers who aren't from here, we do a background check. We give them a, a verifiable card. We have them pay taxes. We give them the protection of our laws and our labor system. And we let them come here and work with us legally and above the table. You know, the system used to work something like this. Good men and women would come across the border legally, called the Bracero program. They would work sometimes under not the best of conditions, but in fact, what I would like to see is a system set up to where people could come here and work legally. And in those days, they'd go back at Christmas, they'd go back when the, when the growing season was over because these were primarily agriculture workers. They could go back to their families in the villages and cities of, of, of Mexico and South and Central America and come back um, within a two or three day period for the next growing season if they needed to. And I think that a system like that actually encouraged families staying together. They would come seasonally to work. And I'm not just suggesting seasonal workers. I'm suggesting hotel work, in any type of worker for which we need workers and we don't have the people here. Let's bring them in to help us continue to grow as a country. Incidentally, um, organized labor two weeks ago announced its immigration plan and they're against the guest worker program and they're in favor of, uh, I'll call it amnesty and citizenship for the undocumented here. I would suggest, since I don't have to be politically correct anymore and I often wasn't in my earlier job, but I would suggest that the unions are just being political. They simply want to register another 10 or 12 million voters. Uh, many of whom will vote, in fact, center left because if I'm an immigrant in a country, I'm going to want more food stamps. I'm going to want more things to help me during those tough times. I don't think you're going to get a lot of Republican voters out of brand new um, immigrant citizens. I wish we could. I got a majority of Hispanic votes in my second campaign. Um, I wish my party were, were better on this issue and we'd have a better chance of earning those votes. But practically speaking, labor understands that most of these voters are going to be their voters, and I think that's why they want to make them citizens. And I've never thought of organized labor as, as really um, doing too much that's uh, not, not particularly self-interested, and I think this current case is an example. Um, Jim's asked me to talk a little bit about the special session we had in Colorado in 2006. It happened um, during an election year. And I'm going to give you the shorthand version and tell you what I think uh, the result was, and then we're going to open it up for, for critique, comments, questions, and discussions. Um, Colorado Supreme Court in, in uh, the summer of 2006 threw out a citizen initiative that was going to say essentially, and it was badly written incidentally, and I think it would have failed, and it was, it, was, it, was a, it was really a bad as it was written. But what it did was it said you can't have any, any public services for those who are here um, illegally. But it was so badly written, it would have, it, it, city parks, I mean, all sorts of things were covered by it. But these citizens got the requisite number of signatures and put it on the ballot. And the Supreme Court threw it off in a, in a fairly, uh, um, many would argue, and, and even friends of mine on the left privately agreed, they reached to pull this off the ballot. Well, um, I thought that the people should have a right to vote on it even if they were going to vote it down, and it was badly written. It would have been tough to have the debate. I, I, I didn't know how the proponents were going to be able to answer the objections, but I was angry at the Supreme Court, not, not at the court in its role, but I was angry at its decision. And so I said, we're going to have a special session and see if we can put it back on. And it was, it was, I was going to limit it to that one subject. And the subject was going to be, shall we have this initiative on the ballot, yes or no? And, the, and, and under Colorado law, you can put an initiative on the ballot one of two ways, through a citizen initiative or through legislative action. I felt the citizens had, had unfairly had their right to redress taken away from them thought it would be a two or three day session. And uh, 
You can check this, but, but what I'm telling you is, is factual. My friends in the Democratic Party challenged me to open it, the session up. They said, don't just allow us to only talk about this. We want to go after employer um, mandates. We want, to, we want to argue about, you know, other issues. So I said, okay, it's going to be an open call. In Colorado, the governor is able to narrow a call for a special session or broaden it. Governor has the power to set the agenda. So I, I said, and, and it was Joan Fitzgerald and Andrew Romanoff, who I had lunch with yesterday, incidentally. Andrew's a close friend of mine. They said, we want to discuss everything. So I said, okay. And it was about a 10-day session. A number of bills passed, one of which was, uh, was controversial, though I'm strongly in favor of it. And I did back strongly the mandate on employers, the punishment, but it failed. Um, liberals were against it because they didn't want to discourage employment and conservatives were against it because it was anti-business. So it didn't really have a strong, you know, there were a number of us for it, but it died because of opposition from both sides of the aisle. But uh, the bill that passed that I'll talk about, and I forget its number, but somebody here probably remembers the number, it's 10 something, 1023. What it says is, is that it sets a system Federal law um, almost forever has said that in order to receive federal benefits, you have to be a citizen. And basically, in order to apply for Medicaid, you check a box saying you're a citizen. Well, we made that much more substantial in Colorado. You have to prove you're a citizen. You have to bring in proof of it. We toughened up our driver's license, and incidentally, that's something that almost all other states are doing as well, because driver's licenses, for a number of reasons, um, should not be easy to counterfeit, and ours was, and so were many other states, and the Real ID Act passed by the federal government requires states to do this. But basically, we, we enforced federal law in terms of receiving benefits and also state benefits. We had the same laws on the books that in order to get tuition, in order to do other things, you have to be a citizen. We enforced it through that bill. Now, I'll tell you one, one impact of it, and I haven't seen the data recently, but the first year after it was in place, Medicaid enrollment in Colorado was down 10%, and it was up 2% in the country. And I believe, just based on, on uh, my experience, but not based on any other data points, all the neighboring states were up, ours was down. I think it's because when it came time to renew people couldn't prove their citizenship, and that's basically the percentage that, that dropped off. And I believe that's a good thing. Um, in terms of immigration in Colorado, it, it probably costs us as a state the illegal immigration. Dick Lamb makes this point, that it's, it's hard to make an economic case for the 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20-year-old uneducated but hard worker at a minimum wage job adding more in taxes than they end up costing in social services. The reason is often schools. Um, we do provide free K through 12 education to everybody as a liberal and humane country and state, regardless of citizenship. And uh, a top official in the Denver Public Schools has told me privately that he believes that half of DPS's children are either themselves from another country or are the children of persons from another country. Doesn't mean the parents are necessarily here illegally. Doesn't mean they're necessarily um, not citizens. But more than half of Denver's kids are first or second generation immigrants. Today it costs us on, on average about $8,000 per K through 12 to educate a child. Denver's more like 10. And so that's a very significant load for that 18, 19, or 20 year old to make up if he or she happens to have a child. Um, so, so again, um, I, I want to see more immigration. My heart goes out to those people who are here illegally, but I think in terms of our own national interest, we need to, we need to secure the border, set up a guest worker program, set up a, a increased legal immigration, and then finally, and I'd be glad to discuss this, I don't want to take more time right now, I'll be glad to discuss it if you're interested in terms of what we do with those 
folks who are here illegally right now. I think there's a humane way to deal with them that, uh, that, that would work, and uh, we'll see what happens.